thoughts on that. So um, the first thing I'd say is throughout my entire career, it's been really hard to um, forecast the macro sort of, I would just call it beta picture. Um, obviously, different asset classes have different performance. So it's not just beta to S&P, but beta to bonds or beta to whatever. And crypto is no stranger to having a kind of beta phenomenon or um, a correlation phenomenon. So, uh, you know, it's easy to tell that, you know, there's a gloomy outlook after the fact, right? It'd be nice to, to know ahead of time, right? So it sort of works the same way, you know, forever and ever. There are people who are good prognosticators of this kind of stuff, but there aren't many of them. And the average, there's probably not somebody like that in this room. I mean, it's very, very rare to meet somebody who can tell the market cycles and market timing. Like that's an extremely rare skill. And most people who have that skill seem to not be able to repeat it. So, um, so basically after sort of watching that for, for around 20 years or 20, almost 25 years of, of investing, um, the first sort of 10 of which were fairly clueless. Um, I've sort of determined that, you know, it's best for me to, to avoid beta and avoid, avoid, um, Kind of trying to just have exposure that's um, universally um, long, and so cash is probably like a safer hedge for those of you who are maybe too timid to do shorting. Um, but cash and shorting kind of go go hand in hand, um, in my opinion. Cash is just a, a really safe hedge, um, you know, whereas uh, shorting is a hedge where you can get positive alpha. So I think that if you look at um, the macro again it's fairly unpredictable you know I, I i think i said this on a different space is that in six um in six months i could see four different scenarios ranging from really good to really apocalyptic so you know, it's just not that useful um and to to very middle of the road um so i really you know think it's a waste of time for a lot of people to to speculate and pontificate and sort of you know just kind of um generally um, guess in essence what's going to happen in the future, and part of the reason for that is there's everybody has the same information, and in essence most of the information that influences the macro is fairly unpredictable. Would you have envisioned a Ukraine war? Would you have envisioned uh, dramatic inflation, et cetera, et cetera? If you didn't get those trades, I don't know how you would expect to get the the next trade that's unpredictable. You know, so the best um, thing to do is to use your expertise in a narrow field. It could be crypto, it could be whatever. Um, and just try to get alpha. Um, and again, if you're scared to short, you know, just keep cash as your short. And I think that's good enough. So in terms of crypto itself, I think that a good example, for example, would have been to be long Bitcoin. You know, again, this is retrospect. To be long Bitcoin and to be short virtually everything else, right? You would have done really, really well. Um, you know, so there's a fight, flight to quality right now. And typically flights to quality happen when, when there's nervousness about um the macro and other things like that. So again, hard sort of circular definition there, very difficult to sort of have seen that. Um, Solana uh, is an example of probably would have problems have, have clearly not been solved. Um, and it uh, probably was a good short starting with uh, their first sort of outages. And now that, you know, you've had repeated, repeated outages, it starts to call the ecosystem into question. Again, I actually was looking up Solana documentation today. so. I'm not saying that the blockchain is cooked or whatever, but I was just joking about finding a low latency um, blockchain. And somebody said Solana and I replied with, I thought Solana was deprecated. Um, you know, it's brand new, but it's still, <laughs> it's still sort of one of these things that, you know, it's, it's, it's going through some unfortunate um, times right now. And uh, you know, that's sort of a, for, for a fast trader, you know, it was, it was a pretty good opportunity. Um you know, obviously, you know, if you're really, you were really brilliant, you could have found a way to short, you know, some of the stuff that's dropped 90% or 99% in the case of uh, Terra Luna and so forth. But but that, that would have been nice um, in retrospect. So I think staying, just staying with Alpha and trying to find the most robust sort of, you know, infrastructures, as you mentioned, is the name of the game. It's very difficult, just like stock market. I mean, it's not easy. I think the good news is that the arbitragers in, in, um, in crypto, it's still sort of a young native industry. Uh, I'm sorry, a young sort of industry that still um, doesn't have like the the amount of arbitrage intensity that Wall Street has with stocks and things like that. So um, the flip side is that there are only so many things to trade. So there there is some arbitrage. So again, whether it's with smaller coins or with you know um, sort of reacting quickly or being delta neutral, there's a lot of probably ways to to make money in this space as well as 
um, different asset classes like stocks and so forth. So it's an exciting space. You know, I'm really excited to be a part of it, um, contribute to it as best as I can. And, um, you know, still learning quite a lot. I don't know if that answers the question or if my group. I heard it mention um, DAOs as oh. well. And I, I particularly like really have my own really kind of extremist views on DAOs. And they really, I don't think they've really kind of like um, really hit on what, idealistically it's supposed to be like you just see like you know with with luna and like you have certain people that have majority like say so like so even if the the average retail holder of the dow they pretty much have their own sentiment and then somebody comes in like doquan and kind of just tries to like flesh out their opinions so i think you know idealistically it sounds great um theoretically but like in terms of like realistically i don't think we've gotten to the point of really like having an efficient dow um model yeah and you know i was um true true that there's this place uh this dow pleaser dow and so it's really funny because i have personal experience with with pleaser dow to some extent personal um i had a a record that i had a physical copy of and i had a digital copy of and pleaser dow spent four million dollars buying the digital copy but didn't even think about whether or not i still had i'm sorry the physical copy without thinking about whether or not i had the physical copy I'm sorry, I keep getting these backwards. They bought the physical, and I still have the digital, and they didn't think about whether or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, your line is too much noise. So you gotta, you gotta either speak or go on mute, and you shouldn't speak while I'm speaking. So, I'm sorry, Martin. Yeah, it's alright. Can I? Can I? Yeah. So when you speak while I'm speaking, stuff like this tends to happen where we keep waiting for each other to talk. You should just like wait until there's a logical place where I've stopped. That's typically how humans communicate, and then you can jump in. So anyway, um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, so there's this DAO that bought the, the most expensive record in the history of mankind, right? Four million dollars, and they never bothered to figure out if they never bothered to sign an agreement with me. I mean, never bothered to do anything, you know. So you have this really ex- a really sloppy example of a really big transaction that just kind of has gone left now. Um, because, you know, DAOs aren't corporations. They're not quite equipped to do that. And, you know, I think it's kind of irresponsible, um, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of organizing, you know, a DAO. Like you have to, there's a reason companies have lawyers. There's a reason companies have board of, boards of directors, CEOs, things like that. Like they're not great. All that stuff sucks. You know, don't get me wrong. I hate boards of directors. It's really painful. Um, Gurgavin is here, by the way. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, what but the like, they, Yeah, but they clearly <laughs> shot, shot the bed with this Wu-Tang thing, at least. So, yeah, I agree with, with default that DAOs are kind of um, a great thing in concept. But, I mean, the very first DAO was robbed, right? So, you know, now we have this Pleaser DAO that, that kind of did a really ridiculous transaction. Um, and I can tell you that I don't think the Wu-Tang album, I was betting that it was worth $500,000. I bought it for one point five, So I assumed I would have lose, lost most of my money going into it. Um, so, you know, buying it at 4 million, I don't think makes any sense. And certainly buying just the physical copy of 4 million really doesn't make any sense. So I think DAOs are, DAOs need to sort of grow up and, and get better before, you know, we see them become a real thing. All right. Can I ask you, no, something? Martin? Yeah, now that you're All the right. speaker, you can talk. <laughs> All right. Uh, first, I like, I really like your attitude, man. I really enjoyed it, like uh, the video, like the videos on YouTube too. Like the lessons you gave, they were so fucking good. <laughs> but anyway, um, what's your opinion about uh, Do Kwon? Do you think he will go to jail or? Yeah, good question. So um, I, I'm curious what the other dudes think because you know they're they're just as uh, interesting and even more so and just as smart or even more so than I am, but. When Do Kwan made those tweets about, like, have fun staying poor and, like, all this stuff, like, you know, really kind of a jerk. Um, I don't know if you guys saw that. Did any of you guys see that? Yeah, I followed Do yeah. Kwan, I believe. Yeah. Oh. I mean, you got to be a real asshole to talk like that, you know? Like, I know and never say something like that, and I'm a real asshole. So this guy's, like, next level asshole. So I don't know. That was, like, a great sign of, of like, just an incompetent kind of dick person, and I'm... You know, I don't, now I don't want anybody to go to jail because a bunch of us have been to jail and it's just not a like a good or fun thing. So, you know, again, I think you kind of get what you deserve in life and, you know, he's kind of getting what he deserves. 
I hope so. I really hope so. Also, I mean, generally, like, you know, there's the, the big debate about, like, oh, well, it was just a failed project and all this and that. But it's honestly, like, at the end of the day, he's promising his investors this unsustainable APY uh, that's really backed by a lot of venture capital funds. And, um, I mean, he, he knew there was a giant discrepancy right there, right, with all the, the backing they're doing of Luna. You know, they're doing these big purchases of Bitcoin. And he, I mean, I think it was like two years ago or whatever, he even basically stated the type of attack that could be done on their currency. And and it, it happened. I mean, as to like who was behind it or whatever, you know, we could speculate on that for, for forever. Um, but generally speaking, also like um, Enrique was saying, his general demeanor towards people criticizing him um really just kind of like formulates like what's i think is going to happen to him i'm not gonna like like you said also i don't wish that on my enemies because you know it's it's not a fun time in prison but um i honestly honestly at the same time i don't feel bad for him and what he's doing right now with luna 2.0 like i'm just i'm astounded that he's not facing like a trial right now um, I think even some federal prosecutors spoke out and saying that it would hard, be hard to uh, prosecute him on this. Um, but the fact that he's just, you know, 60 billion liquidated and he's just going to move on and make the next Luna 2.0, which is doing terrible right now. And I've just been shorting it um, mercilessly. But, um, yeah, I don't I have a very extremist view on him. So, you know, I'm pretty biased on that opinion. I think uh, zero times bunny has his hand raised as a question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah thanks for uh, hosting the space in the AMA. I kind of got two questions. Just want to hear your guys' thoughts. In the DeFi space, I've been in, exploring uh, liquidity mining on DEXs. Um, and right now in a bear market, um, it seems uh, a little difficult to do so because there's not as much volume. And um, also just opening up a short on the two that I'm providing for because I'm not doing it with stable coins um, to, to remain Delta neutral. I just want to hear you guys' thoughts on that strategy. And if that's something that makes sense in this, like in this market right now. Yeah. I mean, these guys know a little bit more than I do, but I think um, being long the underlier is obviously the big risk. And that was the sort of joke about some of these other, um, you know, sort of uh, APY as, as default said, opportunities like if somebody's offering you a 50 to 100 percent return all you have to ask yourself is w what's illegal about this <laughs> or why is yeah, this not gonna like, last where's like, where's that coming from yeah that's yeah, it's yeah. extremely valid the last time i saw something like that i was um running a hedge fund and some guy came to me saying he's doing 50 to 100 percent or more than that in fact uh and he was doing payday lending and other kinds of like relatively extortionate type of lending and i, I passed on the opportunity um, for a number of reasons, but one of the reasons is there's usury laws as well in this country. So you, if every state's different, you can't really lend somebody money at 40, 50 plus percent. So, you know, the, these opportunities do exist in, in crypto. I just think you have to be really careful about what's the catch because there's always a catch now making. Yeah. 20, yeah. But yeah, no, no, appreciate it. I think that's kind of my whole thing too. Like I got into crypto through mining because contributing to the consensus makes sense to me. That's value. Um, so that's where I started exploring liquidity mining. So like when this coin gets exchanged, you get a small percentage of that fee and then opening up the short kind of helps keep you Delta neutral, but I can't find the conviction, which I think I answered it myself out loud, but it's just right now I find, I find it difficult to, to really um, continue with that strategy with like low volume and moving towards a bear market. Yeah, I don't personally do it, so I don't know, but. Uh, I think some of these guys have a better yeah, opinion. I definitely um, can agree with you on Delta neutral strategies right now in this market sentiment. It's really paramount. Um, I myself am looking into a lot of Delta neutral because honestly, um, I mean, you can argue back and forth of if we're in a real bear market or whatever, but uh, choosing to just go long or short right now is really just the risk reward in my opinion is not really there. Um, I, I don't know which exchange you were talking about. If you were talking about GMI, uh I've um, actually been doing it on Uniswap V3 because I can set the boundaries um, with low gas. So, for example, I can open up uh, a liquidity providing like an LP and then say I get out of range, I can open up a new uh, LP 
very quickly with low gas fees. So it's not like doing it on Ethereum where you open, you provide this on like Tracer. And um, if you do it on Ethereum, you're paying like, you know, gas each time. Therefore, like having a really tight bound isn't a good idea because you're not moving in the high frequency trades. Um, but, but yeah, I, I've been doing it on uh, Uniswap V3. Yeah, as to like the APY, what you're talking about, a lot of these projects, they keep saying this, but it's like you have to show your investors where this APY is coming from. Is it sustainable? Um, or if it just like, I think right now, what is it that's running out of their payouts? I don't know if it was Curve Finance or if it was like um, is it Celsius. I can't remember. But a lot of these um, APY payouts are just like, like I think Tron right yeah. now. The USDD is just... You know, it's the same thing over and over again. Uh, yeah, rinse, the, the big APY, like if you look at the uh, the strong kind of vaporware kind of thing with just crazy APY. But uh, on to my second question, um, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Oh, cool. I just want to respect everyone else in the space. Um, uh, as the we're moving into this bear market, not too much um, activity in volume. Um, still a decent amount, but a lot of things are happening in the NFT space, which causes memes, which I feel is the best way to get eyes on anything. And just looking at like what the new meta could be with NFTs, like my thought, and I just want to hear your guys' opinion, is kind of rewinding back to the original with like a free mint and then putting some type of small royalty on it. So the team's incentivized to make a really strong NFT community utility and on the second hand market the trading happens which incentivizes the team to continue to push because it kind of with these like high mint rates it seems like it's like when a startup gets vc funding and just kind of like okay we have our funding now we can stop yeah i think that's reasonable you know it makes sense to me i mean i think the big question is can can a new meta really happen um that's that's exciting. I'm sure, no doubt, there's so many creative people out there that will see something new. But I was just complaining the other day about how tired the whole 10,000 kind of avatar-esque kind of, you know, whether it's goblins or miladies or what are we going to get next? Toads, you know, fucking snails, you know, uh, God knows what. You know, every single kind of thing has been done. And we need something new, you know, something fun and new. And hopefully one really creative person can make... Uh, five or 10 million bucks figuring out what that looks like. But I'm kind of sick of, you know, yeah. uh, cool cats and bored apes and, you know, all this stuff is just kind of corny to me. Goblins. Yeah. I think what Ryder did was a good example of just like the, the artwork showcase just to start that conversation. Um, but it all comes back to like what you're buying is, you know, a unique token and almost treating that as like a, a software validation code where like, if you buy this NFT, you have acts like, that's the what makes the most use case, in my opinion, right now is just the uh, accessibility and viewing it as like when you used to buy Adobe Suite, you get an access code. Now it's just on chain. Yeah, it's great technology. I just think, you know, the artwork is, is suspect and, you know, the least artistic yeah. thing in the world is to make moonbirds. And now, you know, uh, I mean, I've seen every one of these, like it's, there's just hundreds of the same thing. You know, that's not art. The art is when you do something different, you know, and I think like, nobody should buy like something so derivative as like a goblin or whatever. Like that stuff's just too corny. Like you got to think outside the box. Cool. Well, I appreciate your time. I see someone else has their hand up, but thank you guys. And uh, I'll stick around and hopefully chime in. Yo, what's up, Avi? How's it going? What's going on? Real? This, this is dope. Um, yeah, I just, I actually uh, have some a unique insight. I know everyone's got their own opinions on, on the space as I have a, a, a dumb NFT as, as my background, of course. Uh, I agree with you, actually. I kind of do it as, as a. What's going on here? Rugged. Yeah, I think I got rugged yeah, for a I second. Rugged, I feel like I just bought 10 million Luna at face value. <laughs> That's got to be my favorite term that like rolled over. It's just like rugged being used out of context. It's, it makes me smile every time. Yeah, I've been saying it just like on the streets in New York if I like trip over <laughs> something or something. Yeah, my girlfriend, I've been saying it. She's like, wait, what? Like, you're on the computer just saying rug? Like, I, are you? what are you doing? <laughs> it's pretty classic.
I have a question. Yo, Martin, do you remember, I think, eight or seven or eight years ago, you were pretty big on Wall Street Bears. I am not sure people know that you're the first founding member of the forum, correct? How does it feel to see it grown into so big right now? Yeah, I wasn't and- the first, first guy, but it's definitely completely nuts, yeah. I mean, it's cool. It, it sort of shows that there's there's people out there interested in finance that aren't professionals but that's kind of a double-edged sword too i think one post i remember is i think about you bashing people who were yoloing do you remember that yeah of course drama yeah like you know finance is about making careful decisions and investing right it's not about just going all in and any plans to go back on twitch or other platforms to do the modeling live i used to remember that you should like go live and tell people how to model and talk about these pharma names I think one company that was the biggest I think was Seldon. Do you remember that? Seldon. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, I think that was the biggest one for you, if I'm not wrong, or the second biggest. One of the biggest, yeah. I love I love uh, showing off some of the modeling skills and uh, techniques, you know, um, so people can make better decisions. Um, I'm not perfect or or even good. I think that you know the the key though is to show different tools and different techniques that professionals use and semi professionals because I think like personally, again, it doesn't work for me and I'm not going to insult it, but things like technical analysis, okay, that's one tool, you know, but are there others? And can you trade right now, trade equities, or did they, like, ban you from that? You can't get banned from trading, um, but I do have some litigation and, uh, you know, I'll just leave that to the court system, but, you know, I can certainly make investments now. Okay. What's up now, Devin? No, no. Devon dot eat. <laughs> How you guys doing? Um, I just uh, I, I was curious since since Luna and Do Kwan got brought up, uh, I was gonna throw out maybe questions or opinions. I've I've been around blockchain space since 2011, um, so I've I've kind of seen all these cycles and um, I've I've been through a few of the crashes and I know watching Luna crash was interesting. I just did what you should, you know, you would do it in 2016, which is just bet on the fork. Um, and that worked out. But I, I guess my question yeah, is... Yeah, good trade. Yeah, honestly, I'm up 20x from all-time high. So That's sick. Started in at 30, and, and now I'm beating what I would have had at 120. So the kind, I guess the kind of... The questions I wanted to put out, or opinion I wanted to put around, like... I know everyone hates Do Kwan, and <clears throat> it's pretty easy to hate Do Kwan given that he walked around with a giant target that said, fucking hate me. And I, I think it's fair <laughs> for him to catch that hate. Um, in my opinion, just kind of looking at it, he looked a lot more like an athlete being extremely boisterous in, in the sense that he was also producing product, or at least his, his community was producing product. So, you know, in one sense, it was a lot of talk. On the other hand, he was delivering. That being said, as soon as he shit the bed, and and I watched everyone point out that he was going to shit the bed before he had to shit the bed. So it wasn't like he should have seen that coming, you know. But the part that I guess maybe is contrarian opinion here, but he showed up the next day after losing $36 billion. <clears throat> I know a lot of people that would have put a gun in their mouth if they had done that. He billion did that. or million? Million or billion? No, but it was not his money, so why would he care, to be honest? Right? I I mean, I know we can put it that way, but... Like, like, look, look, I mean, who was the last guy to destroy that much capital? Bernie Madoff. Did he yeah. kill himself? Yeah, like oh, right? years. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't get a chance, I mean, and he is yeah. dead. He was in jail. His, his I, son did kill himself, if I'm not wrong, correct? One of his yes, sons. He did. Yeah. yeah, so I guess my point is that I'm trying to make here is... We can disagree that he or agree that he shouldn't be running a thing because I don't I don't think you can fuck up like that and you get to just like remain at the helm and necessarily get to run another thing. But I, you know, I bet I took my position in Luna to begin with because it was a VC like that. I wasn't betting on this fucking fake money. I'm sorry. It wasn't hard to run the numbers on how those things work. You can't only pay out value. You must create value that someone is willing to pay for also. So that wasn't it. But I took my position and I wrote our, our position all the way through simply because it was a 1% bet of our fund. It was not a high-risk, over-levered position. 
we were betting on a project that was still early. And no, so, so, so if I could just jump in. Yeah, go for yeah. it. It was obviously a great trade. So one, congratulations, right? And it's a prudent trade, right? Like you said, 1% position sounds very prudent. And I'm putting up, um, I'm asking Raul to put up um, a quote from uh, Teddy which is, and anybody to hey, see. Enrique, you're cutting out, you're like glitching, but uh, I just saw that message. Sorry, I was in, hiding behind okay. my DM. Um, I can't put it up unless it's a tweet. That's the problem. Okay, I'll tweet it out. Like it has um, to be a tweet, and then you, I can pin it up if you want. Yeah, I'll try to tweet it out. So, you know, one, I, I thought, you know, it was a brilliant trade. You know, I, I participated in a little bit of that myself. So, you know, great investment. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, the, um, you know, it sounds like it was prudent, a prudent risk, a prudent uh, bet. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of putting on this quote from Teddy Roosevelt that I think everybody knows is about the, the so-called man in the arena, right? That the critic is is just a critic, right? And that the person that actually, you know, um, goes in there and risks his ass and, and tries to make something, and even if he fails, is still, you know, sort of the the person who tried, right? And the person history remembers. All the naysayers and all the haters on the side, you know, are, are what they are, right? So, you know, not to cut, you know, not to throw a default on the bus or anything. I'm just saying that, you know, there's something sort of to that. Um, so I'm with you on that kind of, aspect like the guy tried he did his best he failed he was a little arrogant on the way up which is kind of the, i think the only thing i'm pointing out um you know he was sort of so sure of himself and so kind of so much of a dick that you know nobody's upset that he's failing and you have the same dynamic with like elon musk um you certainly had the same dynamic with me um you have a dynamic with like a lot of people who are sort of just kind of like oh yeah take your best shot i nothing's happening to me and then life comes and and humbles you and you you know kind of have a learning experience you know and for him the learning experience is really big right that's the, the big difference is like most people's learning experience is like getting fired from the ice cream shop his learning experience is like oh yeah i lost 60 billion today mm. you know so it's a really like painful uh you know public spectacle that you know is is a cautionary tale i think and in, in that you know the, the more people don't like you the more they're going to shoot at you and try to find a way to to, to expose what, whatever you've done that's wrong in your life, period, you know, and that sort of happened to me to some extent. And I think for him, you know, I think his arrogance probably got a couple of people to crack their, crack their knuckles and say, you know, how do I figure out how to uh, take down this protocol? And, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of people probably just said, oh, you get what's coming to you. And that's what happened to Doquan. But I don't know if you guys think, have any thoughts on that. I know default's pretty emotional about it, or maybe you can tell me how, what you think of what I just said. Wait, why, what, what's the deal with that? I don't know the backstory default. Did you, were you long loon or something? No, no, no. I made tons okay. of money. Um, it was actually my biggest trade ever. Um, I never was, I mean, I actually, that's not true. I was in Anchor for a little while, and then I got out once I realized it was Ponzi-nomics. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's tons of perspectives to take on this, and I don't hate the guy per se, um, but I think he knew what he was doing all along, and he was just trying to keep the, like, the sinking ship going per se. Um, but I definitely don't believe that he should be heading up another project right now. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't want to give too much of my, I have, I'm really biased on this. I just, it is what it is. Um, and I, like he said, I don't think that I don't give too merit, too much merit for him showing up the next day, because at the end of the day, what are you going to do? Run away. That's just going to add credence to what you're doing was like, you knew what you're doing. So like, yeah, you had to show up the next day, um, to like save face. Um, but yeah, but I'm humans not... don't, I think my only point with that is it's not, that might be what we're supposed to do on paper. That's not what people normally do. People do run away. They run he's away a... all the time, but he's obviously not your average person, right? This guy is kind of like, I mean, some people would even say this is not even valiant behavior. It's almost sociopathic because he's sort of, it's right? going to be on the edge, right? Yeah. Like, like the thing that we ask of leaders to to, to show up and like be optimistic and win. He get rugged. Mm. Yeah, good time to move on. We've been talking about Doquan yeah. for too long anyway. Yeah, yeah let's, let's you know, what's up, white so, boy punk. Can I just add yeah. one thing? Yeah, go on, Saz. Oh, all right. Uh, so the thing is like, uh, you all know that Doquan uh, worked like at Microsoft. And Apple? Sad already asked his question, Greg. Give someone else a chance. Allegedly, right? 
Yeah, I thought the question was already answered. Hello. So what do you? Yeah. So what do you? What do you think about his experience, the Microsoft and Apple experience? Sad. What do you think? Yeah, I think probably he learned. Yeah, he learned as a, his coding skills. Like, I mean, you know, some people from Terra, uh, from Terra Labs, I think, was the company called, uh, which he made. Uh, uh, that said, uh, yeah, that he. How do you say that? What? I'm sorry, English is not my main language. Um, that he harassed them, and he's really sociopathic. Like, that's some I don't know, but like he destroyed so many lives. That's why I hate him. Yeah, I think there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, white boy, did did you wanna go ahead? Yeah. Yeah, hey Martin. First of all, congrats on your release, man. I'm just excited to see you back. Long time follower. Thanks. Here. Um, also, fellow Albanian and Baruch graduate, by the way. Wow, uh, that's uh, very rare. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask I mean, it's kind of exciting to see Mr. Algorand in your name. I've been following Algorand for a while and was kind of always like, uh, I guess, intrigued by the proposal there and the future of it, you know, solving the trilemma and whatnot. Uh, what are your thoughts on Algorand? Are you bullish on it? Yeah, so I hope I can only only have to say this once because uh, I got asked this like four times every space and I appreciate your question. And um, I have a lot of love for Baruch and Albania, of course. But um, if you could just go on mute, great. So, um, so it's 80, 90% a troll, mostly because there's... Uh, some PR person at Algorand that doesn't like me talking about Algorand. And uh, one of the things that you probably should figure out if you're doing PR for a blockchain company is that you can't really um, stop somebody from saying or doing things in the blockchain. So if you're going to take on a client like that, you know, it's a good, good thing to learn. Um, you're going to get all kinds of people that can say whatever they want. Um, so now Mr. Algorand forevermore, it's going to be on my gravestone. So I think, um, Tough lesson for that person. But no, I agree that it's a very interesting uh, protocol. You know, it's uh, not the only one. There's other ones like it. And I do think that the greater point to take away here is that there's sort of this false prophet in Vitaly Buterin, um, who I grow more and more suspicious of every day, to be honest. Um, you know, one, we, we have a very, like, weird roadmap to sort of ETH2 um, and uh, whatever you want to call their their new proof of stake. Um you know, it's got a couple of names now, I think. So, you know, the whole idea of, of this surge of trilemma has been um, more or less debunked, I think. And whether it's Avalanche or Algorand or Solana or, or others, you know, we're going to get to the, or any brand new blockchain we don't, we don't know about, we're going to get to a sub one second widely distributed high TPS layer one solution. And I think that's a problem for Bitcoin and for, and for Ethereum. And uh, you kind of have to do what a lot of these companies have done, which is you have to a lot of companies in the non um, divert de decentralized ledger technology space, which is that you have to, you have to put yourself out of business, right? You have to innovate so fast and so quickly and so masterfully that your own products are the ones obsoleting your old products, not some other, some other companies' products. And I think, you know, you can look at Oracle and many other companies that sort of rest on their laurels and certainly Bitcoin is in that dynamic, right? Satoshi quit Bitcoin in like 2013 or 2012, you know, he said he was, quote unquote, onto better things or onto other things. I don't know after you make the greatest invention of all time what you could possibly go on to other things to do. <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, very funny that uh, Satoshi moved on. So, again, I don't know what blockchain will, if any blockchain will replace um, um, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. But I do think that the so-called trilemma is, is a farce um, and that we will have a, a blockchain, if we don't have one already, that, that has all three sort of desired features and you know that's just um my two cents i like algorand but it's i'm not saying that it's like perfect or that you know it's it's the winner or something like that i don't know yeah it's unfortunate avi actually works in crypto space i'm curious if you would have some more insights here by the way enrique i uh, pinned that quote you were sharing above so if anyone wanted to read that whole thing that enrique was talking about it's on the top i don't Thank see you it for that, Martin. you don't see it i see Anytime. it Anytime. As long as you see it. Um, yeah. Anytime. Default, yeah, you see it? It takes a second to load. It might take a second, Enrique, but it's there. I'm sure people can see it. 
Yeah, so I give Doquan one one point for kind of at least being, you know, he did it, right? So anybody that wants to blame him or talk shit about him, you know, he, he actually built something. Yes, it failed, um, but he did. He did build something, which puts you one step above, you know, somebody who hasn't built something. So it's very, you know, that's my problem with journalists, right? It's very easy to criticize. Like, you, you try making a blockchain. You try building a publicly traded company. It's not easy, you know, and uh, if the fact that it became successful in the first place is somewhat commendable. You know, again, so I'm sort of, if I had to pick between a critic of Doquan and Doquan, I'll take Doquan any day. But certainly, you know, you don't, that's not the only two choices. You know, they're not, uh, you know, collectively yeah. exhaustive. Yeah, talking about journalists, what happened to Blumaguan? Do you have something with? Oh, the, the woman? Yeah, that left a job for you. Yeah, I think I've dated like half of New York City at this point. So ultimately, you know, there's uh you know, I just kind of, you know, keep looking for the, the right fish, but, you know, she wasn't the right fish. So um, who knows? At this point, I think I have to start moving on to, uh, um, you know, the rest of the uh, um, alphabet soup of the LGBTQIA. There's so many letters in there. I got to gotta be able to find Bro, some, every somebody to Bro, they add something else. Like, they added a number, too, I think. Like, what the hell? <laughs> they two should be a number. LGBT, a number. <laughs> yeah, they have, like, two, three LGBTQI XYZ. Like, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I think that's... Uh, like soon will be numbered by hashes. I think that, you know, the idea of the name will be uh, redundant very, very soon. What's up, Howard? Hello, Martin. Uh, big fan. Um, I just had a uh, general question. So given the uh, volatility of the uh, market in the last three years due to COVID, uh, do you find it useful to view ratios like the P.E. ratio and the P.S. ratio over multi-year averages? Or do you typically just stick with that uh, typical uh, one-year rolling? Yeah, I don't I don't um, use ratios. I think they're kind of like um, more or less like a poor person's or an uneducated person's guide to the market. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, like there's there's so much more to a company that can't be embodied in a ratio, for example. The, the primary thing is risk, right? Because you could have a company that's growing at 10% that, um, you know, has a, is trading for 20 times earnings. And then you have another company growing at 10% that's trading at 20 times earnings. But company one is far riskier than company two. And company two perhaps has a lot of one-time um, costs that are depressing its earnings. So you have to, if you're going to use multiples, the very least you have to use adjusted earnings, which, you know, is already kind of like, starting to, to screw things up. So to me, I think the number one thing you got to do is just value the company like you work at KKR or Carlisle or Blackstone or some other private equity house, maybe like Berkshire Hathaway. And you say to yourself, would I buy this company and take it private? And if the stock's at 50 and you would pay 100 to take it private, then it's a good long. But if it's at 50 and you would, take, you would pay 50 to take it private, um, it's not a good long. And if you use that framework, generally, I think you can make money in the markets, uh, at least as an investor in the long run. Now, P.E. ratios aren't useless, but um, I think there's so many issues. Like, for example, if I remember when Pfizer was trading at 10 times earnings, but Pfizer has a bunch of R&D expenditure. Of R&D was trading for like six times earnings. And this is a portfolio that was going to last for a long time. It wasn't just earnings disappearing. So um, er, price to earnings ratios aren't terrible. I think price to sales ratios aren't very useful um, for, for because you don't know what the margins are, right? You can have companies that trade less than one times price to sales, but they have 5% margins, right? So the math is kind of tough, tough to use there. For software, it's sometimes useful because you generally assume there, there's a lot of margin. Um, but even then, that can be dangerous. So I, I think multiples aren't, like I said, the, the, the worst thing in the world. A lot of people use them as a lazy method to um, value companies. If you're valuing companies, you shouldn't be lazy. You should be really, really careful and really kind of thorough. Um, and I think that, again, try to take the perspective of somebody who's taking over the whole company instead of um, somebody who's, you know, just sort of like wants a quick and dirty um, trade or something like that. So I don't, I just try to be very thorough and you know a lot of the companies i deal with don't have earnings right and that doesn't mean that they're bad companies for example for many years tesla had no e for a pe right but it's still one of the best performing stocks ever 
Um, so how do you use the E if there's no P, you know, how do you use PE if there's no E? You know, you have to make adjustments and you have to use future out years and so forth and so forth. And all that, there's an app for that. It's called the DCF, right? So you do a DCF or a DDM and you can get a fair value for a company um, based on, on its, ca its future cash flows, which is, you know, kind of what a private equity firm does. So private equity firms don't buy growthy companies usually, um, but, you, you know, we can and we don't have to buy entire companies. We can buy shares and take advantage of so-called Mr. Market. So that's my sort of two cents. It's a very Graham and Dodd approach, but it does work and keep you out of trouble. Um, it may not double your money every year, but it will give you decent returns if you follow that like Warren Buffett kind of, uh, you know, um, Graham and Dodd approach. Good to know, thanks. Yeah, I know other people here are traders, you know, and I respect, in fact, I really respect traders because what they do is very, very hard. <laughs> I know Jeremy's and, uh, got a lot of uh, fundamental um, knowledge in the market. Yeah, Jeremy's yeah. really good. Gurus He's like my little so fundamental trading. Mark, if you wanted to have yeah, a turn. And I mean, hey, Martin, uh, it's nice to talk to you. Uh, I don't think we've had a chance, you know, really collab on spaces before. But I think you bring up a good point. And to the question that was asked earlier, um, you know, when you're looking at valuation on a historical basis, you, you have to take into effect – you know, what the macroeconomic backdrop is during that time period. And if you're just going to use like this kind of cut in stone, you know, PE proxy, um, you know, it's important to note that earnings revisions have fallen um, back to, you know, the levels they haven't seen for five years now. So if you have um, compressed earnings, at least for the, you know, midterm horizon here, uh, just because something looks cheap on a historical basis, you know, optically cheap on a historical basis doesn't necessarily mean it can't get cheaper. So I definitely agree with, you know, Martin, um, with the fact that you can use some tools like a DCF uh, to build your own sort of outlook on how you might value the company. And obviously there's a lot of internal factors there, right? Like, do they have a moat? You know, do you like the management team? Uh is there something that, you know, they really de uh, deliver that offers some differentiation uh, throughout their comps? So there's a lot of uh, a lot of factors that come in. Um, and as you mentioned, like the volatility that we're seeing right now is pretty incredible. You know, me personally today, I thought today was interesting because we kind of saw this inflationary trade uh, resurface. Right. You had um, the 10 year, I think, break over. Uh, it was like 3.02 percent. So, you know, levels that didn't see from early May. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, right, we have a Federal Reserve that's going to start, you know, tapering asset purchases in June by, I think, 47 million. Um, you know, I know the first taper starts June 17th um, and then come September, they're going to ramp it up to 90 million. I'm sitting here thinking to myself that we have a, you know, 10 year bond auction on Wednesday. Um are there necessarily going to be, you know, foreign participants to step in when, you know, the dollar is also rising at a pace we haven't seen since 2014, the cost of capital is increasing substantially, and the largest, you know, international buyers, Japan and China, are seeing sharp depreciation of their currencies against the dollar. So I do think we saw a little bit of front running there. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens on Wednesday, especially, you know, with the CPI print on Friday, too. Um, I think that's going to be a key metric for, you know, government, governmental treasury stability. Um, if there is a surprise to the upside, we definitely could. <laughs> we definitely could be due for some volatility uh, heading into the quarterly OPEX. So just, you know pretty crazy times these you know this week and next um i think i think we should get a little more clarity um in the back end of june and like heading into the summer and then obviously come september you know the fed has hinted at a potential policy pivot so you know the markets might try to front run that throughout the second half of the summer if all these you know leading economic indicators cooperate so those are just some stuff i'm trying to look at here um you know martin i'd love to get your you know viewpoints on what you're seeing kind of on a day-to-day -day basis um especially with like the stagflationary trade like resurfacing today yeah did we lose him yeah I hey, think no, uh, yeah yeah, I was just going to say, I don't really pay attention to the to macro too much because I found it very hard to handicap over the years. You know, if you try to 
tease out alpha. Like for me, like, um, you know, managing a, a biotech portfolio where you have market neutral exposure. And then if you, you know, want to do tech, you know, let's say you have four really solid, long, long software ideas. I think your best bet there is to find four stocks that, you know, you're convinced are going to be relative underperformers to your four longs and just try to stick to that. Now, if your life is going to depend on trading macro, you got to look at all the things that you're talking about and then some, right? You have to look at spreads. You have to look at all types of crazy things, right? There's people that trade rates, right? Steepeners and flatteners, um, you know, using swaps that trade rates for a living. And you can make a lot of money trading rates. You could lose a lot of money trading rates. Same thing with equities, right? So for me, I'm an equity guy. Um, I'm good at, like you said, sort of figuring out whether a company's got the right kind of moat, um, whether or not you like management, whether or not you want to buy 5% of the company or all of the company sometimes, which I've done a few times, um, or just be a small passive shareholder. Um, you know, volatility is your friend uh, when you're an equities guy um, or gal. When there's um, when you have other people's money, it's a very tricky game to play. Like um, some of the multi-strat hedge funds are doing pretty well this year because they're more market neutral. And then you have the guys like Tiger and others that are suffering. They're down anywhere from 10 to 50 percent because they're basically long biased. Right. And they're in privates and you can't short privates. Right. So <laughs> they're ultimately in, in a whole lot of alpha. I'm sorry, a whole lot of beta. And it's very high beta stuff. Um, so, you know, to me, I, I like to sort of. You know, if I'm long Pfizer, I got to be short Merck. If I'm long GSK, I got to be short Santa Fe. If I'm long Amgen, I got to be short Gilead. You know, that's the kind of portfolio I like to build. And if I can't make money doing that, I think Julian Robertson, the Tiger founder, um, I've worked at the Tiger Cub, but the big Tiger boss, who's like 90 years old now, um, he said that if you buy 100 of your favorite stocks and you short 100 of your least favorite stocks and you don't make money at the end of the year, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> I think that that, that sort of, it applies to crypto that applies to macro too. Like I, I used to talk to a lot of Soros guys, the tiger cub I worked at was initially funded by Soros. And I became friendly with a couple of Soros portfolio managers. And even then, right? Like they have portfolios where they're, sh they're long Thai bot and they're short Swedish Krona. Uh, they're long, you know, Euro and they're short dollar, they're long bonds and short stocks. And, you know, great value does that stuff, obviously at Bridgewater. So if you're a good trader um, in macro or stocks or whatever, um, you know, great. If you're a good quant investor and you, you program really great algorithms, great. If you're a, a fundamental bottoms up kind of private equity focused person like me, you can make money. If there's any, there's an infinite number of ways to make money. I think the only like things that really, you know, as you know, as a trader that really matter in the long run are your own psychology, risk management, you know, things like that. And, you know, again, I'm not a macro guy, but you know, I've, I, I, for like six or 12 months, I moonlighted following macro and it's it's a hard space you know you it sounds like you you keep on top of it pretty well um i don't i disagree with some of what you said about about bond auctions i think china's got plenty of reserves and i think that with the interest rate hikes that we're seeing in our country this is this currency is the currency you want to own and we've seen that right with the dollar index um but again you know i'm not uh, a monetary you know monetary economics expert or anything so you know I'll leave that alone um, but, you know, it's a totally different dynamic trying to understand, you know, um, you know, the economic trends and, and those complexities versus the micro kind of like little trends. Like, does this cancer drug work or does this arthritis drug work or is this drug not going to be safe or, the, or does this blockchain, you know, really so provide a solution or does this NFT class of goblins? Is this better than I'm long goblins and I'm short uh, apes? You know, that's a, a good pair trade. So <laughs> I don't know what you think. Is about that, that. Is that a thing yet? Can we, can we short NFTs? We were yeah, talking dude. about that the other day, honestly. And I, you know, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> it could pop off if you, you know, get no. some marketplace where you could trade like perps on NFT. Yeah. I mean, they, so, so some already exist, but if you told me I could short every board ape in existence, I would love to like that. Goblin's I mean, hero. Yeah. Like, goblins the, of, the issue about, the, the issue about board apes, though, it's like there's so much like celebrity and like influencer money like pumped into it that that's a good you know, thing. That you is know, true. That but, means like, nothing. If I'm you like, ask me if I could trade against Eminem, listen, I don't want to be in a rap battle against him. But if you <laughs> told me, you know, Eminem wants to put a ten million dollars on a trade, I'm taking the other side of that. That's that's a fair point. I, I guess I was more so like. You know, getting at that, like, money potentially is, like, a little bit more expendable for them. So, you know, they might not be forced sellers. 
And yeah, it, you just have to wait, right? Like you just have to find the right entry point and wait. It applies the same thing as you know. I mean, you you sound like a very experienced market participant. I mean, it kind of applies to any like anything that's kind of going parabolic. You know, you, you have to ask yourself, do you want to short the first half of the parabola or do you want to short it like when it's clearly put in its peak and it's starting to come down? I think board apes have clearly put it in a peak, right? I mean, they're there's nothing new, I mean, other than the other side metaverse thing, which is kind of like the only way to keep this thing, breathe new life into it, which is very smart on the Board Apes people part. You know, they kind of have, you know, created a new product. Um, which, so maybe it'll work out, you know, but I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be by any means, but like uh, if over evaluations for sure across the board. Yeah, five it's years. like 400k. What's it? I don't, you know, I'm not a big crypto guy whatsoever. I really follow it, but it's like what, like 400k for a JPEG at this more, point? More than more than that. And, um, you know, the average one, yes, is a little lower than that, but there are plenty that, that are close to a million or more. And so, like, to me, if five years from now, that's I, that's old Warren Buffett question. And you're gonna have to excuse me for this whole stream because, like, I'm a Buffett, Buffett holic or a Buffettologist. You know, I, I do believe he's the, the goat, um, by far. And basically, you know, ultimately, um, you know, he wouldn't buy, you know, 10,000 JPEGs for $2 billion. I think 10 years, you know, so his, he's always said, you know, pretend the market's going to close for five years. I think five years from now, like, I, I, I really don't think that they'll be worth that. And again, maybe 10 years is the better number. But, you know, you have to ask yourself, what's the final price of this thing? And ergodicity, you know, the, that sort of concept of we're seeing stochasticity right now, it's a very stochastic market, but... I, I really don't think the JPEGs last in the long run. Um, but, um, you know, I could be wrong and I'm willing to be wrong. It's not like the super high conviction idea I have. I would like like your to, to the guy earlier's point who bet one percent on a lunar reflation over the fork. Like that's a one percent position. Right. That's not a 50 percent position. You know, 50 percent position is when you have a dead to rights and you know for a fact it's going to fall apart. You know, that's not the case with board apes. So they could go up. You know, I'm not saying I'm putting my foot down and I'm 100 percent right. Um, you know, but I, I think a 1% short position in board API club would be fun and profitable. I see we got a bunch of questions. Well, um, by the way, one way that you could, I don't know how you can directly short it, but there are exchanges uh, that do offer right now betting on whether the floor will be at a certain amount at a certain date. So that is something that you can take. Sounds like a put option to me. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, a few different speakers, like you said, Jeremy. I don't know who was first. Maybe Espresso. I don't even know what this name is. Um, yeah, sure. Hey, up? everybody. Thank you so much for having me up. Appreciate um, you know you guys hosting the space and everything. Um, a few minutes ago, uh, I guess this was sort of related to blockchain, right? Uh, in, in blockchain, if we think about like decentralization, this is sort of a prerequisite that I see is like, important and i think a lot of people hold is important uh without decentralization it's, we might as well just go back to traditional relational database management systems right so maintaining decentralization feels like an important sort of area of innovation that like bitcoin and ethereum did differently over the last several years um enrique earlier you brought up the blockchain scalability trilemma which i think is a pretty big topic of conversation and the thesis here is that um enabling anyone to be a validator or block producer using consumer hardware enables a lower barrier to entry, which has the downstream impact of making sure it's a larger, more decentralized network, right? So how, sure. I guess my real question is, how do you balance the need for scalability while also maintaining that decentralization at the base layer? Um, how important is it to ensure a extremely decentralized blockchain network? And, um, do you look at things like layer twos, such as optimism, ZK sync, um, you know, what specifically attracts you to algorithm, uh, to Algorand and some other networks? Thanks again. Yeah, without getting into too many weeds, and I, I gave um, Raul another um, paper to throw up. I mean, people have been talking about concurrency and async and programming for 40 years, right? It's not been like a new thing. Um, and I think that, you know, Certainly, the new thing is that there are all these nodes willing to participate now. And I think that sort of is what solves the trilemma. And so you're right. I mean, I think the fact that anybody can be a Bitcoin node and, you know, um, is a great thing. But if you also look at the node number, 
it, it wasn't that high when I last checked it. I was in prison. I, it's, I still think, is it, you guys know, is it 10,000, 15,000? Um, let me put up the, the paper. I keep DMing it to you by accident. Sorry, I forget what you just told me two minutes ago. Um, so, yeah, there's a bunch of papers from the 80s that I'm just going to throw one out there that, um, you know, talk about concurrency and, and, again, multi, like if you look at threaded programming languages, right, you know, the, you have issues with things like C versus say, JavaScript because you, you have a, a lot of problems with having more than one thread and race conditions and the execution loop and all that stuff programmers have to deal with on a daily, daily basis. So without getting into technical you know, matters, which you know, I'm not sure I can even do necessarily, I do think that you have you know, a solution in the form of uh, you know, the massive number of nodes. And clearly these networks need more nodes, right? Solana, Algorand, all these things. And that's where the Gini coefficient comes to play to some extent. Right, but we spend time looking at the wrong part of the Gini because I think the most important part is the number of nodes that are really stable and supporting the network. And I think that, you know, it's hard to sort of get nodes unless you have, uh, you know, you have some incentive for them, right? I mean, the first time I downloaded the whole Bitcoin blockchain, I, you know, very shortly thereafter deleted it, and I said, why did I do that? You know, this is useless. <laughs> um, you know, I just took a whole bunch of gigabytes off my hard drive, and you know, I didn't get anything for it. So I think there's there's sort of you know, all the nodonomics that sort of have to take place to, to really ensure that you can um, sort of have your own trilemma solution. Um, and again, I don't know which one's going to sort of solve it. I think right now that, that question is an open question. Um, certainly layer two is, is an obvious sort of, uh, you know, sort of turbocharger because ultimately, like if you think about eventual, like, uh, or verifiable, you know, sort of um, eventual sort of con concurrency, I think for a lot of use cases, eventual concurrency is what matters. So, you know, whether it's a um, verifiable delayed function or, you know, whatever um, me mechanisms that you can use to sort of eventually get concurrence or consistency, I should say, every node has the same data. It's okay if you don't get complete consistency immediately in some cases. So again, depends on the use case, right? For money, that doesn't work. But for, for certain other things, there is sort of some wiggle room. So, you know, eventually the, the network has capacity, right? So you might have little capacity in really tough times, but, you know, event, you know if there's eventual sort of um, capacity available for compute or for resharding or replication or whatever, you, I think you have a benefit from that. So, you know, again, I don't, I don't know. You know, if I had the answer, I would implement it. <laughs> you know, we're going to have to sort of wait and see. And I think that you have, um, you know, part of it is... Um, Exper experimental and theoretical and experimental are, are very different things, right? You have a lot of great theoretical um, solutions and then you have to actually sort of make it happen. And I think, you know, whether it's going to be, um, you know, something we have now and it's just going to need a little more scale and more nodes uh, joining a network or if it's something that hasn't been invented yet, I do think, I, I feel fairly good that we're going to get a solution. And in fact, I don't think we're too far away from one based on some of the performance and some of these networks like Algorand's never had downtime. You know, it certainly seems safe to me. Um, you know, scale is the bigger question for a lot of these things, right? Again, I, I was joking that Bitcoin's TPS wouldn't support um, the block I live on, let alone, um, you know, the entire globe. So I think, you know, a lot of people who have sort of like, who feel like we're, we're changing the world and that everything's changing because of the Bitcoin and blockchain, we have a ways to go. You know, we actually don't have that much throughput um, in a realistic basis. And you know, that's neither on Bitcoin nor on Ethereum. I mean, the number of actual transactions per day, can, does anybody know off the top of their head? I think it's several hundred thousand on Bitcoin. That's not very many. Um, that wouldn't be a lot even for, like I said, one borough of New York City, let alone, you know, the whole planet. Default, well, what's, what do you your, um, what's your opinion on, on Lightning for, for Bitcoin and like the plausibility of its use, use case? I, I don't know for sure. Um, I don't know, you know, so let somebody more advanced uh, answer that question, but I'm not, I'm not sure. A question I have maybe is like, you see any cryptocurrency becoming like, you know, a medium of exchange instead of the, the US dollar, I guess. Yeah, I don't see any reason why it's not, um, why it's impossible. I, I think that there's all the reasons that, you know, we can all agree on why it's, it may be difficult or frustrations may abound. But I do think we're ready for a new technology in money. And money is a technology like any other technology, um, you know, so I don't see why um, we have to move off. We can't move off fiat. And I think, in fact, we inevitably will. 
you know, for a number of reasons, freedom is probably one good one. Um, people want to be free and fiat sort of a constraining uh, paradigm. Uh, anonymity is something that's probably um, what people want, um, whether they know it or not. Um, you know, I think that that's a great use case and reason. And then finally, you have kind of global utility, right? I come from a country called Albania, which is a pretty pitiful place with uh, its own little currency. And there's around 100 countries like Albania that have their own fake currency. And um, they don't really work. We have black markets, we take euro, we take dollars. Um, and so giving those countries kind of a decentralized voice, you know, one of my friends is an economist uh, who um, said, well, those countries should just use dollars. And many countries, many of those countries do. Uh, the problem is you, you don't necessarily want to use some other country's currency, especially if that other country, country might become hostile to you. You know, it's, it's a really difficult place to be. So I think you want to try at least um, to have this like nationless currency or sovereignless currency, I think would be pretty good for countries like um, Albania and the, probably the entire Balkans um, that don't want to be on euro and, you know, don't want to be on dollar. Um, you know, there's, again, probably 100 countries where Bitcoin adoption would be pretty, uh, pretty welcoming, uh, welcomed and uh, stabilizing force. So I do think you can see that in other countries before you see it in the U.S. And by then you have so much legitimacy that, you know, there's not a lot of... Uh, you know, kind of a resistance to the idea. Uh, and again, there's no actual way to sort of effectively ban Bitcoin. I mean, you can certainly try, but, you know, unless you sort of, you know, packet sniff everything on TCP IP, I, you know, even, even then, I'm not really sure you can do very much. So, you know, the key is that, of course, services and products get denominated in Bitcoin at some point. And I think that's, you know, really going to be a big turning point. So we're early, but I do think like, Again, TPS has to be improved dramatically. I, I don't have a comment necessarily on Lightning. I, I don't want to say the, say the wrong thing. For the transactions for day on, on Bitcoin is like roughly around like 200K. And like you were saying, comparing that to something comparable to like like Visa, I think they do like 100 to maybe like 150 million a day. So definitely needs to be some improvement. Um, but if I'm correct on like Lightning, isn't it somewhere around... Uh, supposedly i mean i need to do some comparable instead of like the the yearly i think they said daily they could do um to a trillion i mean i don't know i mean if that's just theoretical not bad practical you know you know it sounds great on, on the white paper but like i want to see use case in real world scenarios on a large yeah scale. i think people yeah people close to 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 the space have at least expressed a lot of skepticism to me about uh bitcoin uh, lightning but again i i I would don't want to offer a comment just because I, I just don't know enough. You know, I'm going to spend some time researching it on a long to do list of things I have to do. But, you know, there's other there's other solutions, too. Right. I mean, I think there's you know, Bitcoin has a ways to go on on lots of things, encryption um, and security as well. Like, you know, uh, again, I, I don't think we're going to see quantum uh, supremacy anytime soon. But I think that, you know, that's still another question of, you know, can you get a quantum safe algorithm? Because ultimately, ECC is itself you know known to be somewhat unreliable occasionally so um you know i'm not saying bitcoin's hackable today but it's the kind of thing that that does make you wonder um so inevitably there's going to be a, have to be a lot of upgrades to bitcoin and i think that one of the problems with bitcoin is just the practical uh, upgrading consensus is pretty difficult i think in an emergency you know you could form a consensus pretty quickly but i think that you know there's been you don't have to look very far to, to see bitcoin cash bitcoin sv other things like that, that, you know, clearly this isn't an easy piece of software to upgrade. It's not as simple as a GitHub repo. And that's kind of what it was intended. That, that's part, that's by design, right? That's not a bug. That's, that's exactly the way it was supposed to be. And the problem is if you have a technology that needs to rapidly iterate, I, I you know, this isn't the, this isn't sort of the place you want to be. And we're seeing that with Ethereum, right? I mean, Ethereum is sort of a clusterfuck for the same reasons. And, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I think like having like a roadmap where you slowly decentralize over, three to five years may actually be better than, than the other way around is as, as bad as that medicine may taste. Your alternative is to sort of get it right by putting it in stone. And it's like, ask, ask five programmers to sit down and write a repo that they never, ever change. You know, it's sort of yeah, a good luck with that. Um, yeah. It's basically impossible. Right. And like, you see all these, these people who are, are pounding the table and saying, Oh, we're the next like Ethereum killer. And it's like, Oh yeah, that sounds great on your white paper. And then you see the real world use case, like Solana and AVAX, and you have to see like, can you handle even like half of their user base and over and over again, that's just not the case. So you could 
talk as much smack as you want about ETH and all these other ones. But at the end of the day, look at what's happening with Solana. Look at what's happening with AVAX. Like they just can't hold water when it comes to even handling like part of their traffic. I mean, I can't even count like a week that's gone by without Solana, their TPS going like sub 500. Yeah, that's not that's not without you trying to crash the network. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I should say that's without you trying to crash the network. Yeah, no, no. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, pretty good trade idea, right? Short of short of the crypto, and then go DDoS their their server. I'm sure it's already I mean, happened. It's, it's a really comparable short anytime their network goes down, but it's like. You know, it's funny trying to like do any per perp shorts on against Solana when their network's going down. So it's like you have to be um, on some kind of exchange and not using Solana to short their network while they're going down. Pretty predatory stuff. I, w I would never do something like that, but, you know, I'm sure other people don't have that kind of uh, ethical barrier. Yeah, who would do that? Not us for sure. Jamie, right? Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. Oh, let's man. move on. Let, let's move on. Yeah. There's a CN. There's a CNBC reporter in here. I gotta block them. It's like CNBC is the most cancerous, toxic, like media establishment there is. As long as it isn't Lori Siegel, because she is wildly um, uneducated when it comes to crypto. Yet she's their main person to handle that kind of stuff. It's pretty funny. I don't think there's anybody educated at CNBC. It's like a lot. I've complained about this a number of times. Like a lot of these media organizations, they especially televised ones, they optimize for looks more than they optimize for brains. Like I've had friends interview at uh, major media companies, including CNBC, and they were like basically told they're not pretty enough. I mean, if you look at their TV show all day, you know, it's in essence, you know, optimized for their, their, user, for their user base, which is hedge fund guys and, and bro brokerage firms sitting around. And basically, if, if you look at the what they put on TV, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about and be as diplomatic as I can. Um, but, you know, most of CNBC is watched while it's on mute anyway. So it's sort of like a funny yeah, thing. It's because, background. You know, yeah, background. Yeah, it's basically just background. So, you know, again, it's, it's sort of a... Say something and then inverse it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but let's move on. Um, I think we already asked, answered Expresso. Winslow, did you have a question? Yes. Um, so my question is sort of regarding the psychology of money. Everybody's in here bring a P ratios and, you know, technicals and macro ideas. So my question is kind of more simple and it's regarding the psychology of money. So somebody that's experienced all the ups and downs in life as you have, uh, has your opinion on money changed over time? Do you think it's more money, more problems? Do you think um, you're more happier when you have more money and yeah. you can buy experiences? And then if, you know, you agree you're happier when you have more money, like maybe talk about the best cost benefit for things that you found personally that bring you happiness. Yeah, certainly everybody's different, but I can only speak on, on me personally. And I definitely think there's sort of a weird curve with money. It's kind of maybe a U-shaped upside down U. Um, or, or right side up you, depending on your, your, you know, what you're measuring on the y-axis. But um, I think, you know, if you absolutely have no money, you can be pretty miserable. And that's thankfully just sort of a condition that's getting eliminated, whether it's by technological singularity or by uh, welfare or maybe a little bit of both. Uh, I do think there's an optimal amount of money and that, you know, chasing more of it uh, can bring you a lot of unhappiness. Um, if you like what you do and what you do is building software, you're going to get pretty rich pretty fast. Um, you can kind of even try to, like, not not get rich and it'll still happen back. Um, <laughs> um, uh, there um, you know, having said that, um, the artists that died before, um, is that just me or is he completely? Does he kind of run? Yeah. You're running pretty hard. Yo, uh, Sorry. Martin, I think uh, we lost you at software, I think. The word software yeah. business. The software business is a fantastic business, and very few people that participate in it can avoid wealth. You know, it's really that good. Like, um, I had a software startup that um, was unfortunately terminated due to my uh, incarceration. And um, I told a joke about the wrong person, so I went straight to jail. And um, the, uh, the, the developers of that project... Every single one of them found 
you know, mid six digit jobs very quickly. So like, they're all doing really amazing. And, um, you know, they're, they're all tremendous developers to begin with, uh, software engineers, whatever you want to call it. And ultimately, I think that if you chase too much happiness, you can get miserable. Um, for me, I think, um, thankfully, the things that I love to do happen to be, you know, really create a lot of wealth. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like, you know, it, it's your choice whether you commercialize them or not. I think Buterin's actually a pretty good point on this topic where, you know, he kind of like was pretty... I think it's admirable how he kind of like didn't really try to shove all the money in his pocket. And that's, that's sort of saying, saying something. Um, and it's probably a good thing to do as a younger, younger person. So um, I do think, you know, trying to make too much money for money's sake is a very insane thing to do. Um, you know, if you love to develop drugs like I do, or you love to design software or write software as well, like I do, or manage people, um, you know, all those things are kind of profitable endeavors. You kind of can't, you can kind of, you can't really avoid that. But if you love to, to do art, you know, that may not be a profitable endeavor, you know, whether it's music or, or what have you, like my friends in, in the rock world don't make any money. They're constantly, you know, in trouble for money and um, tons of uh, other mu music uh, genres as well. So, you know, but they still do it because they love it. You know, you have, you have to love it if you want to tour the country in a, in a van um, where you don't get to shower and you're, you're stuck with four people in a really small space. Um, I should hope you love it, you know, but there's something about, you know, music that, that people love. That they're willing to do it uh, regardless so you know i think i think uh, more money more problems is probably right again you know the people i've met that just try to make as much money as possible end up um you know they're either kind of psychopathic and they have very little love in life um and uh you know pretty dangerous people or they end up sort of taking the light and sort of doing things differently uh over time and i think like you see a lot of people who are kind of lost um you know, uh, again, you could even look at some of the people on the Forbes list and see what. Realizing that maybe they didn't get the meaning they thought they would out of the, their day job. So for me, I get a lot of meaning studying um, sort of the bleeding edge of um, lacking in quite a number of them. Um, but, you know, certainly in biomedicine, you know, sort of being at that bleeding edge and learning about this stuff and when you learn about stuff um, in that area, you end up trying to make some of the stuff or build it or extend it or whatever. And, you know, that sort of, um, you know, will inevitably get, bring you a lot of wealth. So it's sort of a happy sort of competition, but, you know, um, I think you have to optimize for the, the coolness of the information and the coolness of the technology. You know, that's what's fun to me. Um, the fact that it comes with money is a nice bonus, but, you know, also, you know, if it, if it starts to sort of take over your, you know, your day to day, um, it can be very frustrating. Like I really look up to the guy like Gabe at, at Valve, who just, like I mentioned, I think on one of the other themes, just wheels his desk around the office, kind of works wherever, doesn't, you know, doesn't mind the fact that he's a billionaire, but he doesn't exactly like live his life any differently. People Yeah, you're cutting off again, 